On Christian World News, is a wave of revival about to hit the globe? These ministers think so. See why they say it's time to prepare for a major soul harvest. Plus, President Donald Trump honors top evangelical faith leaders at the White House. The Commander-in-Chief explains the importance of religious freedom and how he plans to protect it. And a sexual abuse scandal rocks the Catholic Church and casts its shadow on the Vatican. Meet the people who will stop at nothing until everyone involved is held accountable for their sins. everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. Indeed you are, and I am Wendy Griffith. Great to have you with us. Well, many Christian leaders are predicting the greatest harvest of souls in history will soon be upon us. They believe this next revival will be like a huge wave that washes over the entire globe. Sounds pretty intense and exciting. Among them is Toronto Revival Pastor John Arnott, who saw a vision of a wave so big, he called it a tsunami. CBN reporter Paul Strand tells us more. If a massive harvest is on the way, how can believers get ready to do their part? Some of the most well-known charismatic leaders were just answering such questions at the location where the revival known as the Toronto Blessing started in 1994. Questions such as, what should Christians expect? Some say this next revival will be like a huge wave that washes over the whole world. Heidi Baker has helped start thousands of churches and fellowships in Mozambique and around the world. She says she's had a vision of such a wave, and she says it's a glory wave. And I saw the wave, and it's full of faces. And, it, and I thought, Lord, what is that? Are those the ones coming home or the ones going out? And I saw they were the faces of these radical lovers of God, tr every tribe, tongue, and nation, who were going to go to the ends of the earth carrying the glory. John Arnott headed up the church where the Toronto Blessing began. He, too, has had a vision of a glory wave so big, he called it a tsunami in the book Preparing for the Glory. You know, and all these little boats on the top of it, and then this wave crested and came crashing to shore, and, and it was just a sudden, wonderful outpouring of God that was just sweeping. Some may feel that such a revival is impossible in this dark, immoral age, but theology professor Michael Brown says he's studied several times in American history where the most learned men thought Christianity was dying out in the land. Everybody counted the church out, counted God out, and then awakening came. So I truly believe, as much as my mind says it's impossible, I truly believe that the greatest awakening for America, and certainly outpouring for the world, is yet ahead. Brown has often encountered controversy for insisting on biblical truth, no matter how politically incorrect it may be, like on gay marriage. But he insists Christians can stand for such truth and still win over the worldly, who may despise that truth. So we need a fresh baptism of love for a sinful world and a fresh baptism of the image of Jesus in us so that, that we can really be like him to this world. If we really care, the right words will follow. That we also have to recognize that, that the darkness always hates the light. We have to quit trying to please people and be accepted. We must speak the truth in love. It's not either or. It's both and. Revivals are known for burning brightly, but then always burning out. Well, there are those saying that if the next one will put Jesus Christ right at the center, it never has to die. So that's a part of preparing for revival. I think we can up our prayer lives. We can reprioritize, you know, how we spend our day, how we spend our money. Um, he needs to be number one. He's our, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Bridegroom King. We want to lift Him up and lift Him up and lift Him up. As He be lifted up, all men will be drawn to Him. Jerry Hill is the widow of Steve Hill, the evangelist at the center of the 1995 Brownsville Revival. And at one point he was going to be put on Time Magazine and he said, you know what, I think you need to put God. Get a picture of God because it's really all about Him. I am only a vessel that He fixed. She points out he preached a revival couldn't supersaturate the whole world till every believer becomes an evangelist to those around them. And when Steve and I would go out, we would talk to people about Jesus in the supermarket, in an antique store, in a restaurant. You take it out. Well, you keep your heart right, keep short accounts with people that have offended you or hurt you or whatever, and you just 
get rooted and grounded in the love of God and get ready for more. Have little gatherings at your at your company. Have little gatherings at your school. Just come together and love Jesus and then shine. Don't be afraid to share your testimony. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Light the Fire Again conference in Toronto. Thanks, Paul. Well, President Trump hosted evangelical leaders at the White House this week. He spoke about his efforts to protect religious liberty and the need to rally voters to the polls this November. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy has details from the North Lawn. It was nothing short of a state dinner here at the White House, only the president wasn't honoring a foreign head of state, but evangelical leaders. America is a nation of believers, and tonight we're joined by faith leaders. Faith leaders like Reverend Franklin Graham and Pastor Paula White. It's an honor to be here. The president also took a moment to publicly express thanks for Senator John McCain's service to America. Our hearts and prayers uh, are going to the family of Senator John McCain. going to be a lot of activity over the next number of days, and uh, we uh, very much appreciate everything that Senator McCain has done for our country. Trump then turned to the dinner's purpose, honoring America's faith and freedom. In recent years, the government tried to undermine religious freedom, but the attacks on communities of faith are over. We've ended it. The commander in chief drummed up applause, highlighting efforts to combat religious persecution. We brought home hostages from North Korea, including an American pastor, and we're fighting to release Pastor Brunson from Turkey, and we've made great progress. Trump told the evangelical leaders it's imperative that people of faith vote in the midterms so that progress can continue. They're facing uh, the possibility of a Democrat Congress that if uh, they take control of the legislature are going to either impeach this president from office or at least paralyze him while he's in office. And I think they rightly know evangelicals don't want either one of those things to happen. Christians helped propel Trump into office in 2016, and this was one way of showing his appreciation for their contribution to American society and also pledging to protect their rights so that work can continue. The president just wanted to celebrate, and not just that, but what our churches and houses of worship do every day mm -hmm. to provide spiritual direction to the lost, to heal the brokenhearted, to save marriages and lives. That goes on every day in America. The support you've given me has been incredible, but I really don't feel guilty because I have given you a lot back. Faith leaders told CBN News the dinner was the president and First Lady's idea. Yes, it was a time to say thank you, but also that the work is not done. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, the White House. Thank you, Ben. Family and friends of Senator John McCain celebrated his life at his home church in Phoenix. And as Jennifer Wishan shows us, his courage and service has struck a chord with our nation. One last trip to the city where Senator John McCain made such an impact. The American hero greeted by a military honor guard. Friday, McCain lies in state in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda before a final funeral service Saturday at the National Cathedral. Amazing the senator's death and reflections on his life have captured the nation. In Arizona, thousands lined the streets, some holding campaign signs to pay last respects to their senator of more than 30 years. He was America's hero. At his home church, North Phoenix Baptist, his former chief of staff explained how McCain's Christian faith sustained him during the years he spent as a POW at the Hanoi Hilton. He said, you know, on Christmas Eve, we celebrated. And we got together under this bare light bulb and we sang Christmas carols and we quoted Bible verses that we could remember and we told the gospel story to each other. And former Vice President Joe Biden, McCain's friend for decades, delivered a heartfelt eulogy. I always thought of John as a brother. McCain's code of conduct, he says, was timeless. It wasn't about politics with John. He could disagree on substance, but it was the underlying values that animated everything John did. Everything he was you could come to a different conclusion. But were he part company with you, if you lacked the basic values, 
of decency, respect. And with McCain's Christian faith, the promise of eternity to console his grieving family. We will mourn, Father, but we will do so with a different hope because of the faith he has placed in Jesus Christ. That we can with confidence grieve with the hope to know that this very moment he is spending eternity with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. On Saturday, another display of bipartisanship. Former Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, once McCain's political foes, will share their thoughts about the senator's life and legacy. On Sunday, McCain will be laid to rest at the Naval Academy. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer. Coming up, as sexual abuse rocks the Catholic Church, others are working to make sure these crimes never happen again. And welcome back to Christian World News. Sexual abuse scandals rocking the Catholic Church are growing. Mm -hmm. The latest in Pennsylvania, where the Attorney General says the church aid evid hid evidence from police and parishioners. Accusations of cover-ups reach all the way to the Vatican. Now rank-and-file Catholics angry over the abuse want the church to clean house. Charlene Aaron has the story. A statement signed by more than 3,000 diverse Catholics calls for Catholic bishops of the United States to consider submitting their collective resignation as a public act of repentance before God and God's people. The open letter comes on the hills of last week's bombshell grand jury report that sent shockwaves reaching to the top. They found that there was not only widespread sexual abuse, rape of children, but they found that there was a systematic cover-up that went all the way to the Vatican. The Pennsylvania case involves thousands of victims and hundreds of priests. The AG accuses the church of purposely hiding evidence from parishioners and police. Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life says he is grateful the crimes are coming to light and bringing change. I'm uh, uh, happy that, that, that the law enforcement is stepping up to the plate. That has to happen. And um, we just have to continue calling for, working for, and praying for authentic reform. The Vatican responded to the attorney general's claims, telling CNN, quote, if the prosecutor is referring to something outside the report, we'll wait to see that before commenting. On top of that, this week's explosive accusations of a cover-up by the Pope himself. Archbishop Carlo Vigano, the former papal nuncio, published an 11-page letter calling on Pope Francis to resign. Vigano claims he warned Francis about disgraced former Washington Archbishop Theodore McCarrick in 2013, but Francis did nothing about it. Father Pavone cautions that move. Well, you know, before you come to a decision on that question, you need to know what's going on. Everyone is asking in their minds the same questions. Who knew what and when? What did they do or not do and why? Some have questioned Vigano's motives, noting he is a known critic of the Pope. All this is happening among reports of a schism between the Pope's supporters and more conservative Catholics. In his recent trip to Ireland, Pope Francis apologized for the sex abuses that have rocked the Catholic Church. But the faithful may be making their own statement. The Pope's outdoor mass was expected to bring half a million people, but only 130,000 showed up. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Iran's hardline government has sentenced four Christians to harsh prison terms for believing in Jesus Christ. The four were sentenced to a combined 40 years in prison for allegedly conducting illegal church activities and spreading propaganda which reportedly would threaten national security. A number of Iranian Christians have been sentenced just recently to a combined total of 45 years in prison solely for practicing their Christian faith, including, you know, through attending Christmas gatherings and organizing house churches. Now, if they are in prison, they will be prisoners of conscience. So it is happening right now, and we ask you to continue to pray uh, for the Iranian Christians that are highly persecuted. 
Indeed, we must. Amnesty International is appealing to Iran's government to drop the sentences. The four Christians who are currently free on bail are awaiting the verdict of their appeal in courts. More than 100 years after the Ku Klux Klan held a major rally at the top of Georgia Stone Mountain, hundreds of Christians from across races and denominations gathered there to denounce racism. Making the climb to the top of the mountain, participants in the event dubbed One Race took part in a day of reconciliation, prayer and worship. Attendees say the experience was a step toward fulfilling the will of Jesus. Jesus did say this, that, that the world will know that we are his disciples when we what, love each other and we are one. And so this is God's heart, his desire for us to be one, one race. Pastors at the event signed the Atlantic Covenant, vowing to stand against racism and Christian disunity. Well, up next, author and minister Max Lucado explains how you can find hope in a hopeless world. It's all in his new book when we come back. Some sad news to report, Inland Hills Church in California lost its lead pastor, Andrew Stokeline, after he took his own life on Saturday. His wife shared the devastating loss on Instagram, saying her husband struggled with depression and anxiety. His suicide is bringing attention to all the pressure on men and women in the ministry. Pastors have a real challenge in the sense that pastors give so much to so many people and many times the standards of behavior and conduct for pastors is so much higher that they feel isolated. Pastor Andrew left behind his wife and their three young children. The family asked for prayers during this difficult time. More and more it seems the world is becoming a hopeless place. That's why pastor and author Max Lucado wrote his latest book on a topic he believes the world needs to needs to hear more now more than ever. He sat down with CBN's Jennifer Wishon to talk about the power of hope. Famed author Max Lucado has written so many books he finds it difficult to name every title from memory. His latest is called Unshakable Hope. Why did you feel led to write this 40th book yeah. about hope? In this case two things happened. One was just a a sense of uh, despair among people in our congregation, uh, people facing challenge after challenge, issue after issue, uh, generally with the tone of saying, is this ever going to stop? And then about the same time, uh, coming across a statistic that said that the uh, numbers of, of suicides in the United States have increased 24% since 1999. And I, I just was stunned by that. You know, if, if a particular disease increased 24%, we'd call it an epidemic. And you write that God is incapable of breaking yeah. His promises. Yeah, uh, the promises only have value if God is faithful, right? Mm. And uh, every time in Scripture that God speaks, what He says happens. I mean, we find that in the creation story. And God said, and God said, and God said, and it was, and it was, and it was. Uh, when God says something, it happens. He cannot lie, the Bible says. As a pastor, you said that you tend to write about things that are on your heart and things that you're seeing in your congregation and in society. I wonder why right now we're seeing people feeling anxious. And you know, what, what's going on in the world that, that's creating this environment? My hunch on this is that we are uh, seeing the fruit of a secular society. Um, when, when we raise up a generation of people and uh, tell them that all of life is just what they can see, uh, what they can touch, and what they can hear. In other words, there's no transcending power. There's no good God overseeing the affairs of mankind. When you remove that from society, I, my feeling is that that creates a, a uh, discouraged society. It, it, there's, if there's no hope beyond what I can create, no strength beyond what I can muster, no, no solution beyond what we can come up with, we look around and say, well, this isn't very good. You know, it, and I just soon get out of it than stay in it. I do not want to oversimplify the, the whole issue of, of suicide. I know it's, it's a very complex issue, and I, I would never want to, uh, you know, make it sound like there's a one-step solution. But you got to think 
that a generation uh, that does not believe in God, that, that is choosing to turn its back on God, you've got to think that we would soon bear the fruits of that. And secularism sucks hope out of a society. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Hundreds of thousands of people in the flood-battered Indian state of Kerala are rebuilding their lives after devastating floods there. Kerala, Kerala CBS, sorry. that's okay. CBN's Operation Blessing is on the ground helping on the ground helping victims. Kerala is slowly limping back to life. For two weeks, the South Indian state got hammered with catastrophic flooding not seen in these parts in over 100 years. I've lived here for the past 10 years, and this is the first time such an event has ever happened. All 14 districts in the state got affected, causing widespread damage. So many families had no time to save any of their possessions as floodwaters swept through their homes and businesses. 445 people lost their lives. More than 100,000 buildings were destroyed. The government says some 7,000 miles of roads have been destroyed or damaged. Farmers have lost millions of acres of crops. The water here were till the level of the houses. The that tank which we, which we see behind me, it was completely submerged. And now the water is receding and people are coming back from their relief camps. CBN's Operation Blessing teams are there to meet them. Doctors, nurses and aid workers are deployed to some of the hardest hit areas of Kerala, bringing food, medicine, water and other essential supplies. Here, as you can see, there are a huge number of patients and people in distress. The patients mainly have complaints related to fungal infections and waterborne diseases. More than a million people were displaced by the floods, with many finding shelter in thousands of relief camps across across the southern state. While doctors treat the sick and injured at this medical camp, Operation Blessing crews are helping some 300 families as they wade through muck and mud to clean houses and streets that were submerged for days so they can return to their homes and rebuild their lives. Operation Blessing in India and around the and, world doing good work. And I was uh, corrected, it's Kerala, Kerala. And you actually have connections to Kerala. I do. That's right. Your parents are from Kerala. That's right, yeah. God well, bless you. Well, folks, thanks for joining us this week. Until next week, goodbye and... God bless you. <laughs>